Hello, we're getting started now. On behalf of all the students who organize the lecture series, I'd like to welcome you all here. There's like a lot of people who aren't students, which is really neat. Uh, we've had a really good lecture series, and this is the next to the last lecture we have um, after this, Levius Woods will be here. Um, this speaker will take no questions during the presentation, um, but during the reception, anybody can ask questions personally uh, while you're drinking wine and beer, who wants to? And now to introduce our speaker, Aaron Betsky. Uh, the speaker tonight is Neil Denari, principal, co-owner, and uh, full partner in Cortex 17559 Architect at 623 1⁄2 South Detroit Street in Los Angeles. Uh, Neil Denari uh, is, was raised on the wide ranges of Texas, uh, where he also received some form of technical education, was sent to Harvard for finishing, uh, learned all about the intricacies of uh, helicoptering in Paris, and uh, is currently a New York architect working in Los Angeles uh, who moved here a year ago to find rich women who believed in astrology and would allow him to do large buildings. <laughs> and uh, he is now, as he himself says, out there doing it, and I might add, doing it extremely well. Neil Denari. Um, well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe the part about the buildings is true. Uh, I don't know about the other part. Um, I just want to thank um, the students of the second year uh, graduate program for inviting me to uh, speak. Um, it's been a good uh, semester, and I hope I can continue uh, the tradition. Um, and. I just want to um, outline the, the kind of format of the talk. It's, it's for me, an experiment and a kind of first-time thing, and Cyrix's always up for a good experiment, I guess, so I can foist one on you. Um, I've got four parts, basically. Um, the first, and they're about 10 minutes long, so we're running 40 to 50 minutes. Um, the first part is, um, uh, four pieces of um, sound text that I made, um, and they are kind of uh, tracking um, previous works to the works I'll show tonight, um, done over the last uh, two to three years. Um, hopefully the music will somehow, and the slides somehow, will uh, have you arrive at a, at, a, at a point where then I can present uh, three projects um, distinctly, of uh, which two have uh, sound texts uh, along with them as well. Um, <clears throat> so I think I think we'll start with that, and, and hopefully it it will go okay. Can I have the slides, please? And and the spotlight turn it down, please. Um, the name of the four uh, bits, um, the first one is called TV Set Loop, the second one is called Dis Fuzz Disco, the third one is called Geek, and the fourth one is called Nature's Course. Didn't make any sense. Or 
Um, <clears throat> those works were made with uh, guitar um, and um, no synthesizing equipment, um, by the way. Um, <clears throat> the first project I wanted to discuss uh, directly is um, the Solar Clock Project, which is um, a project I did two years ago uh, for an exhibition um, with 10 other uh, New York uh, architects all working on sites in London. The sites were given to each architect. Um, <clears throat> my site was uh, given to me uh, as the Tower of London. Um, there was also some premise uh, to the project uh, that along with um, uh, each person uh, site there would be a, a site given based on whether or not the person had either been or lived in London and half of the five have not and five had I have not um, and um, because of that uh, lack of connection the television set was my only um, a form of uh, image collecting so uh, a couple of years ago while watching Wimbledon, I managed to catch uh, a site um, of the Thames River. The site is to the far right uh, hand corner where you can see the Tower Bridge. Uh, the tower is located uh, adjacent to that on the Thames River. Um, it was a place of fortification built in 1063 for William the Conqueror and had built up in the usual fashion historical um, condensation of layers and walls. Um, <clears throat> that slide on the right is upside down. My project um, was an additive uh, piece uh, after analyzing uh, and going through a destruction of the entire site to rebuild. It was the intention uh, then to not add, uh, destroy anything but only add uh, a piece um, to the site. Uh, the program was as obscu obscure as I could um, make one. It is a clock. Um, it is fit on the um, top wall, uh, the outside wall of the uh, tower itself, um, completing a loop around the site uh, once every 24 hours, the approximation of the day. Um, the project is uh, therefore as a clock very simply um, only relative to its position uh, much the same way that the sun through shadow or through our own ability to mark it in the sky tells us uh, the time of the day therefore this project the, 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 um, the aspect of clockness is basically in location and in its position on the wall in the city as a repetitive situation uh, the project would be built um, and essentially placed uh, or lifted onto the wall. Um, it is uh, about 206 feet long um, and it is uh, about 400,000 pounds, um, a little bit more than, than a, a normal Boeing 747, something like that. And it travels uh, 1.71 uh, feet per minute um, traveling along this wall. Uh, there you can see the plan. Uh, it is essentially um, a vessel, a vessel uh, uh, volumetrically um, containing space. Uh, it is not uh, a project which is born out of a program larger than the idea of the clock. It rest, rests in a kind of obscure fashion, but for me, therefore, it was a suspension of a lot of normal kind of procedures and working and just looking uh, at what I thought was a connection to physics. And for me, it's almost a question of the philosophy of physics. And one of the most powerful uh, questions that we can ask is, is time reversible? Um, Stephen Hawking and others uh, have now um, for 20 years been putting forth ideas which remain largely philosophical about is time reversible or is it in a one-way uh, uh, system as uh, Arthur Eddington um, 
150 years ago uh, told us it was. Um, this project, therefore, would travel in a particular direction until which time, if it were to ever happen, the, um, if the universe were to fold in on itself, it would, at the corner um, uh, bastion, spin around completely and then go back the other way until which time it came to its origin and then it would be a disappearing object itself. Uh, the project is um, uh, driven by an enormous amount of uh, solar curtain wall, therefore linking it directly to the sun itself. Um, the uh, panels which were developed at Stanford are about 30 percent efficient in uh, containing the Earth's energy, or the sun's energy. Um, just a panel symbolizing, which for me was the text of the project, the kind of two arrows pointing to one another, uh, the possibility of folding back or reversal, and kind of using it as, as um, one of the more interesting questions, I think, at least philosophically, for physicists to think about. For me, uh, I don't stand here as a physicist, but merely as an architect um, who is more than interested in the questions um, which drive the uncertainties of I think our culture, whether we know it or not. The section, uh, the difficulty in actually building the project um, would be in a kind of lateral uh, loading situation. Um, so the project very clearly is a kind of deep, um, long beam with many kind of horizontal um, lateral uh, beams taking what would be an enormous uh, load of this object being able to uh, move. It doesn't interest me to try to make it um, operate on superconductors, therefore it's, it's running on a simple train technology. Um, <clears throat> just a moment uh, of history about myself because many of you don't really know much about me. Um, <clears throat> uh, my father uh, was in the aviation business and um, I was at a very early age exposed to uh, a lot of stuff. Um, and this airplane on the left um, <clears throat> I was able to take a ride in when I was um, six. Um, <clears throat> they, they had a, a day where they unleashed this V-Stall aircraft, which turned out to be a complete bomb, um, unfortunately, for my father's uh, uh, side of things. Uh, but for me, it was quite an amazing adventure because to witness um, an airplane which was both a helicopter and an airplane, uh, there you can see the wings in kind of mid-rotation, a uh, very primitive form of uh, vertical takeoff. Uh, the only idea that I had at the time was um, that if, if, if only this kind of stuff could be like more available for us to touch, if it, this stuff wasn't so much behind fences and, and away, why couldn't we have this kind of stuff to play on every day? Um, I think it was, it was a kind of um, a course for me to uh, not want to design airplanes, thank thankfully, but to actually do buildings and to kind of render the spatial quality and, and the kind of inventive quality um, of what this airplane was. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Virginia um, and uh, giving a lecture, and I went to Monticello and seeing Jefferson um, in that house and all of the stuff that he was making, it, it made me realize that, that at least at the time that um, he was around, there was such an air of, of creativity going on, uh, a kind of renaissance uh, for America. And 
I think Jefferson would really get off on some of the stuff that we were doing today. And, and I'm sort of sorry that in Virginia they're kind of so conservative, but that was just a, 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 something I, I thought about. Uh, the next project is uh, called the Exploding Sonic Test Audiovisual Big Guitar. Um, it is a project which is, for me, about uh, a kind of history in New York, a five-year history um, from 83 to 88, just prior to coming here. It is one of the most specifically placed projects that I've done because I think the solar clock is a kind of universal uh, thing. The context of the sun is a, is a, is a universal situation. Um, I was not actually that interested in London, but the culture of New York and the kind of uh, carry-on in, in a city like that, and also in Los Angeles, of quite a bit of the energy of the youth um, through music uh, was pretty profound for me. Um, and I began to uh, frequent uh, lots of clubs and a um, lot of really amazing uh, stuff going on there over that period of time and, and I began thinking about the cultural side of music uh, not only vis-a-vis -vis, um, architecture and also but vis-a-vis -vis what for me is a continuing interest in physics and in this case just pure sound. Um, the, um, the guitar then is one of the most ultimate um, machines there is there's ever been invented. Uh, an American machine. Um, hard to say if, if Europe would have come up with this. Um, and, and if so, would it have been quite this kind of successful in, 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 in kind of changing a nation? Um, <clears throat> so I think back in the 50s or 35 years ago when somebody was taking an acoustic guitar and putting a pickup on it, it, it then must have just seemed very, very clear that the idea was there, ne there needs to be more noise. It's, it sounds too, too nice. Uh, there is, there's a youth out there that's got to kind of take this, this machine and, and agitate. It, and at the same time, I think, kind of carry out a new form of, of music. Um, I think the need of the guitar then was kind of manifest um, and now has become much, much more volatile. Uh, and a continuing kind of thing, both bad and good forms. I suppose all of the music that you don't like could be seen as a co-optation of uh, the guitar in, in a kind of bad way. Certainly our parents could, could see that uh, with all the kind of noise that we've made. Um, so um, this is a tiny little project that I was able to build um, in New York. It was uh, commissioned by Columbia where I was teaching um, for two or three years prior to coming to SciArt. Uh, we were given funds and grants and things and with our own uh, wherewithal asked to build a, a piece in the school. Uh, for me, I wanted to make a spatial piece, uh, an interactive piece, uh, which would explore uh, simultaneously the roots of the guitar, at least culturally, but mostly, once again, the physics uh, of the guitar. Um, in drawing form, uh, you see the plan in the section, and if you can read the dimensions, you'll get an idea about how big it is. Um, the premise is basically an amplified uh, version of the electric or the acoustic electric guitar. Uh, a, a large aluminum sounding box, which the player stands in, or you see in plan the door, and what would face him as he entered that door, uh, would be a 10-foot long stringed instrument uh, and also an oscilloscope. Uh, the instrument, of course, would produce the sound and the player would be able to manipulate it. Um, and the oscilloscope would give the visual readout of the frequencies of the notes or the tones that the player would be playing. It's relatively conventional as an instrument. Um, it has six strings and uh, two pickups. One pickup goes to the amplifier and one pickup is wired to the uh, oscilloscope. There you see the section uh, through the guitar and I might add that all of these drawings were done um, after the project was built. Um, I didn't do any drawings 
before building it. Um, it was an interesting thing because I knew I was going to build it. I didn't actually care about lavishing anything beforehand or um, uh, these were done kind of in, in um, for publication but uh, the project was built pretty much like in the shop and kind of scratching our head about dimensions. It was built with uh, four other students and myself uh, at Columbia in a, in a typical wood shop. It's all aluminum. Um, all the parts were fabricated by hand. The main structure is two by two angle. Um, aluminum sheet ranging from a sixteenth to a thirty-second to an eighth. Uh, and the guitar itself is made out of um, wood and aluminum. Um, what happened when, when we made this project, um, there was this big fancy opening at the school, like a Soho type thing, and, and everybody's there, and, and people were walking up to my project because it hadn't been finished, even at the time of, of the opening. I was in the back uh, with a couple of other people wiring, wiring the bloody thing. And uh, we managed to take this 10-foot long thing and kind of part the audience and we uh, installed it and everybody was huddled around and they are going, well, what, what exactly does it do? What, what exactly does it sound like? And we plugged it in and, well, no sound. It, it, it didn't work. Uh, and I didn't feel any embarrassment at all because, uh, in fact, I felt a, a great deal of, of pleasure because after people found out it didn't work, they all walked away and they went over to the other stuff and I was kind of standing there by myself. Uh, and the interesting thing was is that the piece, the architecture itself, had zero value. No one actually said, well, geez, it doesn't work, but, but this is a really nice bit you've made or, or isn't the skin well detailed. The fact that the workability of this piece was extracted because of its failure, it, it, it took also a value of aestheticism uh, away from it and no one cared actually about the object and for me that was an interesting kind of moment because when, when we see we talk about failure um, or if we talk about um, what is exactly the purpose of something its form, uh, for instance computer, etc. There is much that we don't care about and I think the dilemma in architecture is this question of utility which is not always explicit and the object itself and sometimes we invest too much in only the object and then in this case it was an interesting thing for me it had zero um, value. Sorry, but, 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 sorry
Who the hell do you think you are, buddy? Hey, you think you're in my way like that? Hey, get out of the way, man. I'm walking in front of you, pal. Out of my way. Who do you think you are, man? Who do you think you are, man? Who do you think you are? Get out of my way. Get out of my way. That's the law here. That's the law here. That's the law. Don't you know? 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 Not really true. Don't you know? Yeah, I know. I know. Don't you know? 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 Chevy pickup truck that we'd borrowed from a cousin of mine. And we were moving some furniture into New York. It was late in the evening. And the truck was really old and really worn out. The inside of the cab really smelled a lot of gas. So the whole entire trip we were gagging for breath and getting very high off the fumes. And the steering was loose. It was a typical old truck, 53 Chevy or something like that. The whole bit. But anyway, we were driving in. And we took the BQE and we were going to the Brooklyn Bridge. And we were going on and over the Brooklyn Bridge. And we got to that section where the pavement falls away and is replaced by those metal slats which make up the floor of the bridge itself. And your, and your car wheels run and glisten over that and make this kind of sound. You know what I mean? You've heard it, I'm sure. And the wheels slip and slide a little bit and you always feel like maybe you're going to get a little bit too close to that wall of the bridge. And we're riding along and listen to this sound. cars were driving by making other sounds that would have, you know, that, and that Doppler effect as they go by, right? And it was dark, it was night, and the fumes were making me high, and I was surrounded by wall of guitars about 100 feet up above the East River, and I liked it. photographs are of a metal etching which um, was on the front of the guitar. Um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago I made a, a test for myself, a kind of psychology test. Um, I went and I picked uh, two flowers out of the ground um, and I cut the end off of one flower and I put it in a glass of water. Um, 
I took the other flower and with the roots still on it, I put the flower end in the water. And I put them on my table and I looked at them, I think until they both pretty much died. And it was, it was a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a test because I chose a flower because um, I suppose it's one thing that people often uh, ax axiomatically think is, is beautiful or is uh, something to aspire to or is a kind of representation of nature. Um, the root, I suppose we don't care about. Uh, we don't normally um, want to grow roots, we want to grow flowers. I mean, there's, a, there's an idea about the end there. There's an idea about a processual idea about kind of locating objects in, in nature and locating objects in, in, um, in architecture as well. Um, for me, the root then became uh, subtly and over a few days like the flower. It became the same as the flower and I think the roots became like the flower because it presented itself to me as a foundation and as an understanding that uh, you can't make the flower without the root very clearly. Um, but that the kind of inversion of stuff that we're normally not interested in, uh, perhaps the ugly side of stuff, um, is maybe where there's a generative aspect of, of a lot of good work. Uh, I don't know yet whether uh, what my buildings are, if they're one version of this one idea, a flower or a root. I hope, I hope there's a kind of rootness in it uh, as, a, as a form of beauty um, and a kind of perhaps a, an acceptance of uh, nature in different ways. Um, Los Angeles. Uh, the final project I'd like to present is a competition uh, entry for the uh, West Coast Gateway. It's a project uh, located on the Hollywood Freeway to the north side of downtown. Um, <clears throat> there you see the site itself. It is 1,500 feet long uh, and given as a building volume 30 feet uh, above the, the cross streets or the bridges um, to whatever height you want. We're given in this project uh, that as well as um, very basic intention of it. It is to commemorate immigration into Los Angeles. Um, there were no specific uh, requirements other than a kind of hopeful uh, connection from uh, Little Tokyo to the Civic Center, Chinatown, uh, etc., by foot, although asking uh, quite a bit to make this project be successful uh, 30 feet um, in the air. With that as a loose framework, um, I'll show you what is, or what is um, the first phase uh, of this project. Um, the project was fortunately uh, selected as a finalist I'm now working on. Uh, shredding, by the way, on a uh, project uh, for the second phase, and it's due on uh, next Thursday. There you see the site um, <clears throat> looking essentially uh, northwest into Hollywood on the right, and uh, the site plan of the project the project is hopefully very simple. Um, the premise is to make two buildings and a space in between. Um, the two buildings are uh, seen as um, understanding the, the nature of uh, kind of real and simulated uh, experiences. When the immigrant uh, comes to this country or any new country or in a very uh, a kind of everyday experience when we're dislocated, the nature of the real is in effectively lost and the only uh, form of reality is a kind of recreated one, witness Chinatown or Little Tokyo, or just the will to be able to communicate in a kind of known way. But if we accept a loss, um, 
there has to be in that loss uh, uh, an attempt at recreation. Uh, the building at the bottom of the scheme proposes uh, the activities of the simulated uh, cinemas, uh, technological displays, quote, um, the global community, which is what um, the competition asked for. Uh, the top building um, is the uh, real experience uh, as ironically simulated as far as possible itself. Uh, theaters, um, uh, offices, uh, um, uh, live uh, performance, etc. in uh, that building. Uh, they're essentially uh, particularized loft uh, space buildings. Um, and finally, the plaza in between is some kind of recognition as uh, the project distorts the, very subtly the linearity of the freeway just the distancing or the time between the real and the simulated. The project um, <clears throat> is uh, uh, an interesting one for me, mostly due to um, the uh, jury responses to this project. Um, in fact, I suppose I should be surprised that uh, the project was selected uh, given the criticism of the project. Um, there were around a dozen uh, jurors, mostly from Europe. Um, by and large, they all said, um, this is the most powerful project. Six of them said, why should we go on? This is the winner. The other six said, if this is ever built, it will be like the death of architecture. I'm really happy about that. I'm really happy about the, the lack of, of, of uh, kind of uh, uh, one way or the other recognition of, of not only this building, uh, but perhaps this kind of work of which uh, perhaps this may or may not fit into any categories that any of you might want to uh, propose um, critically or at least contemporarily in terms of other architecture. Um, I think one of the reasons why the project was uh, criticized as such is because of the actual directness of the proposal and the actual directness of the drawings. Um, for me, there is, no, uh, there is no room for error. There is no room for um, ignorance when making a proposition and, and making a building, of which I have to affirm very seriously in this project. Um, therefore, I choose to draw very blunt, bluntly, very directly, and try to portray as much information as possible. Um, the criticism, of course, finally comes down to, in, in perhaps all of my work, and I'm sort of taking on perhaps some of the questions which you might ordinarily ask and which are becoming repetitive for me. Um, and I'm now just basically trying to formulate answers which are not defensive positions, but somehow uh, can be willing to state a proposition. And I just believe that as you've read the, uh, the 14 aphorisms which have um, been interspersed in the talk, that it is in doubt where, where this stuff is, uh, and what side of a kind of line we're on. Um, but the most important one for me is, is that the meeting of culture and technology is not in fact a butt joint or a center line but we should really draw a fat black line around it and call it really the field of play. Um, and to take nature and to not make it divisible or not even to call it dead or not even to say where is it located. The interesting thing about I think living in Los Angeles is that I think knowing that Los Angeles is is a, a, a huge artifice, uh, a kind of made condition of, of, of what we would understand as nature. Uh, that's more enormous machinery to me than, than architecture itself. And I say that not in a, in, a, in, a, in a derogatory light. But 
for me, when I look in the landscape, for instance, of Los Angeles and the way uh, architecture is somehow um, clothed, uh, I think it's a form of technology that it, we don't recognize. Um, this project was also criticized for having almost no space in it, for as if it was a solid object, or there was absolutely no occupation. And perhaps it is m the onus on me, for instance, to figure out a way to more clearly communicate um, the work. It's not a question of, of solid and void or shadow on a wall, but there's something else. I feel as though that, that for me, it's now um, a kind of a partial um, tough thing to, to, to not look away and continue from the work that one is doing while trying to have to answer these questions, but somehow answer the questions, I think, positively in the work um, while asking questions yourself. It's, I think if we sat around answering um, people and not just kind of proving it to ourselves, myself, uh, that the building can actually contain and, and um, become a thing which is not essentially inevitable as a kind of malevolent uh, beast. Um, people call it beastly, uh, kind of in a, in, a, in a fun way, I think. But if, if technology cannot be seen as inevitable, as, as a specter lurking, as uh, inevitable co-optation. I mean, for me, the guitar is an amazing thing because I don't see gu guitar players in the battlefield. It's a thing which is not ever going to be taken and manipulated. It's always going to be used in other kinds of cultural forms of, of um, attack. But architecture, I think, can, can um, do the same. Uh, I just leave one last uh, piece, and thanks a lot. <laughs>